our first speaker will be uh, Beatrice Helen Rizzo uh, from the University of Alberta, and she'll be talking about um, MM star estimates, regular M ellipsoids, and distances between convex bodies. Thank you, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, trimester in this wonderful place, and also to uh, uh, giving the opportunity to speak uh, uh, at this winter school. So um, I tried my best, I don't know if I have succeeded, to uh, give a soft introduction at the beginning to uh, the notions I have in the title. And in the end, I also decided to put in parentheses the last topic because I'm not sure I have time for it. But uh, let's pretend I might get to it. Uh, okay, so the outline of the talk uh, is, uh, we'll introduce the protagonists. I'll try to get to them quickly, at least to the first one. Uh, because there's a lot to say about them. Um, then uh, the protagonists are not completely uh, unrelated to each other, that's why they happen to be in the same talk. And finally, uh, I will focus on uh, what we know about it, because I wanted this talk to be a bit, um, uh, like maybe <laughs> give some inspiration to some people, because there's a lot we know from the origin symmetric piece. One could say that it's essentially settled, but there is a lot that we don't know for the non-symmetric case, so perhaps this is something somebody would like to start working on. Uh, okay, so um, the one of the protagonists will be very much related to the width of the convex body. Uh, so we say width of the convex body, uh, it's a geometric notion at this point, which nothing or uh, uh, probabilistic, right? So if I have a convex body and I want a certain direction, let's say, uh, in this direction, then I take the support and height plane, which is orthogonal to this direction, if I manage to get it correctly, and then I take the other support and height plane, so maybe the other one, the parallel one in the other, on the other side of the body, the other one maybe would touch here, and then I take the distance between the uh, two parallel support and height planes. This would be the width of K in this direction. And of course, in uh, um, asymptotic geometric analysis, very, uh, very often we hear about averages of such uh, nice parameters of the body. So we take the average of uh, the width uh, over the rotational invariant probability measure on the unit sphere. Uh, and it happens to be in the end proportional to uh, the uh, end row of the support function of k over the unit sphere, simply because. Um, it doesn't even matter if the origin is in the interior at this point, but if I had it in the interior, then the support function in this direction would give me uh, part of it. The other part would be coming from the support function in the opposite direction, but because I integrate over the entire sphere in the end, I get both. Now, from now on, for the remaining notions, I actually want to uh, ensure that the origin is in the interior of my uh, convex body, so that's what I'll be doing from now on. Uh, in this case, we can define um, uh, the Minkowski functional, which, when uh, k is origin symmetric, uh, is actually a normal RM. When it's not origin symmetric, uh, it doesn't have the symmetric property. Uh, so the Minkowski functional of y is not the same as the Minkowski function of minus y, but it satisfies the triangle inequality. It is uh, positively homogeneous, so it has some nice properties, and that's what we will be relying on. And then I want uh, the zero in the interior to also define the polar body of K, uh, which again in the origin symmetric case corresponds to the unit ball of dual norm, but we define it in general. And uh, having the origin in the interior, I know that this is a convex body again, because we've all done. And finally, based on these notions now, I'm sorry about that, uh, I can define uh, uh, the mean width again. Uh, and I will be now denoting it as, as m star of k. And similar to that, I will be defining the min norm, which is essentially the average of the Minkowski function of the unit sphere. And uh, it's uh, worth remarking for later that uh, the m k star coincides with the min norm for the polar body of k. Okay, and uh, so our first protagonist will be this product of uh, the min norm and the mean width of uh, a convex body. And we want to estimate from above and from below, primarily from above, because we will see from below uh, we have immediately some inequalities. Now, why do we take product? One good question is that otherwise we would have uh, degenerate bounds, right? Uh, it could get really large or it could get really small. Whereas when we have a product, we hope that somehow it's controlled. 
And this is reminiscent of what happens with the volume product, where again, the situation is if I just look at the volume of K, I can make it really large or I can make it really small. But when I multiply with the volume of the polar, then it's a controlled quantity. Uh, so let's recall what the volume product uh, has as properties and see whether we can emulate them for uh, uh, the MM star that we have above, right? So the volume product is a linear invariant of K. If I apply uh, linear transformations uh, to the body, uh, the volume product doesn't change. Uh, there is also, again, because I don't want to restrict myself to only symmetric uh, complex bodies, there is a unique point in the interior of K such that I can uh, minimize uh, the volume product when I take uh, the polar body with respect to this shift of K. Uh, and this is because this is a strictly convex function, the bottom of the polar when I uh, take the polar of shifts. Uh, so, this unique point is called the center log point of K, and it will be uh, needed in this talk for other, uh, in other places as well. And we have now the celebrated result that when I take the volume product of K with respect to the center log point, then it's maximized uniquely at the ball or uh, linear images in the ball. Right, and uh, the question was, okay, and where it is, is it minimized? Since we know now that it's a linear invariant quantity, it should also have a minimum. Um, oh, by the way, sorry, I have this remark here. I also get the inequality even if I use a shift with a barycenter. This is because when I have a barycenter at the origin, which I achieve if I subtract the barycenter from K, and I take the polar, then the center low point of this is at the origin. So I would get the volume product, the good volume product for the polar of the shift. And that guarantees I still get the input. Um, uh, okay, so there's also the question of where uh, this is minimized, which has not been answered up to now. But uh, for all intents and purposes in many applications, it suffices to know the order of magnitude, and thankfully we do know it because of uh, another celebrated result, the Bugen Milman equality, which so shows that it's also minimized by the volume product of the ball times some constant to the n, which is any, all we could hope for anyway, because the conjecture minimizers also uh, have a sort of magnitude for the volume product. So that's the Mahler conjecture that the uh, unique minimizer are again linear images of the uh, n dimensional syntax. Uh, okay, so. Back to the quantity we want, so the product of min norm, min width. So there is obviously the uh, first bound we can try, which is just maximize the two functions. Um, and then we can see that the first quantity, uh, its maximum is one over the radius of k. The second quantity, its maximum is uh, the second radius of k. So we get this uh, eccentricity, you were calling it, yes. So we get that this upper bounds uh, the quantity we care about. And then uh, for lower bounds, the, the other initial thing we can try is uh, Jensen's inequality. So the L1 norm is, uh, uh, dominates so the N minus N norm. And um, uh, then by polar integration, we can see that this actually is the volume radius of K, uh, or essentially the volume ratio of K over the, vo the volume of, sorry, the ratio of the volume of K over the volume of the ball, uh, nth root. So that's one lower bound we can have. Again, this we only get for the min norm. We don't need the product here, but we can apply it now for the min width as well because we said uh, the min width is uh, the uh, min norm for the uh, polar of K. And uh, for um, the support function, we know that if we uh, shift the body, uh, the shift comes out as inner product with the uh, vector by which we shifted. And inner product uh, with a fixed vector integrated over the sphere will give us zero because it's a odd function. So we can shift uh, without any harm to the quantity we want to calculate. Um, and then we do the same as above. So we lower bound this by the um, reverse of the volume uh, uh, ratio of the polar of k shifted by the center low point. And then we can multiply these two quantities, which of course gives us the uh, this is lower bounded by uh, the volume product of the ball, the volume product of uh, the best volume product of uh, K, which by the black percent of the ball is bigger than or equal to one. 
Right, so we have an immediate lower bound that this uh, can never be uh, too small. But what happens with upper bounds? Uh, so we have one more lower bound, uh, which relates, uh, so we could look at the initial, the naive upper bound that we gave, right? And we can say like how uh, good is it in some cases, or is it always uh, way off? So uh, the answer is that at least the circum radius can be used as a lower bound uh, for the mean width. And uh, the way we do it is uh, uh, we note, first of all, that the uh, bind symmetry and uh, uh, yeah, maybe if you do a bit of uh, polar integration uh, to uh, turn it into integration over the, speed, uh, over the unit ball, it's easier to see it, so we always have this uh, identity here. So uh, the uh, it, uh, approximately equal, there's an explicit constant that we can find, uh, which is uh, very uh, close to one. Uh, and then uh, we can take, um, we, we can recall that the circum radius is the maximum of the support function of uh, k, but it's also the maximum of the Euclidean norms uh, of points in k. So we take uh, the point that actually uh, the circum radius is attained at, or one of those points, and we rewrite uh, rk over square root n in this way, but then this is roughly equal to this integral here, and then uh, we recall that the support function of phi, uh, I can write it here, so support function at uh, any vector phi, here it's a unit vector, but it doesn't matter, it's just maximum uh, over x and k, uh, dot product of x with phi. Right, uh, so uh, we, we can have a bound the uh, dot product that we have inside because we have absolute value we should take maximum of the support function uh, of phi n minus phi, and this is uh, obviously upper bounded by two times the min width. Uh, here it's crucial that zero is in the interior because otherwise I could make the circle radius huge, whereas the min width uh, is not affected by shifts. Uh, so, we can now use this lower bound together with the volume bound that we had. Uh, so, for any uh, volume preserving, let's keep the volume now fixed, whatever we started with. Uh, so, for any volume preserving linear transformation, this product that we care about is lower bound by these two quantities. This is by the previous inequality that we had, uh, which resulted in volume ratio of uh, Tk, and this is by the inequality we just showed. Since it's volume preserving transformation, uh, it's the same as the volume of k, so this quantity actually does not depend on the transformation. This won't depend on the transformation. I can make it very, very big. Uh, so I can make this uh, quantity uh, arbitrarily large, which means that I'm doomed if I want upper bounds like that. So I have, as is usual in uh, uh, many of these problems, to take the infimum over all uh, linear transformations, and in fact, as we will, as we will see, when I'm in the non-symmetric case, so uh, I'm not, I don't have symmetry about any point in my, inside my body, uh, then perhaps shifts also play a huge role. So I have to also minimize over possible shifts as long as I keep uh, the origin in the interior of my convex body. Okay, any questions up to this point? Okay, perfect. Um, ah, yes, and... Uh, the one thing that doesn't matter actually for the product is uh, dilations, right? So it's not hard to see that if I had m r of k times m uh, r k star, this would be integral over the sphere of the norm uh, of the body r times k uh, times um, involve the sphere of, of the support function of Rk. But here now this, I can remove it from here, and if I remove from here, I have to multiply by its reciprocal, whereas if I remove it from here, I multiply its uh, linear in R, so this two will cancel out. So dilations don't matter, but um, other types of transformations do matter, so I could restrict my attention to uh, volume-preserving transformations. Uh, okay, so that concludes uh, uh, our initial discussion about the first protagonist. Now, the second protagonist 
has to do with uh, nice positions for a convex body where I can start effectively covering it by dilates of the Euclidean ball. Uh, you could ask why dilates of the Euclidean ball is <laughs> because uh, also the quantities we care about here are integrals over the unit sphere. So the Euclidean ball is actually uh, implied in all these uh, formulations. Um, but first, okay, we have the general definition of the covering number of a convex body by another convex body. This is the minimum number of uh, copies of the second convex body that I need in order to, uh, in order for the unit of these copies to uh, contain the entire k. Uh, and then uh, there was a, a, a Samuel theorem by Vitaly Milman uh, in 1986 that uh, showed that uh, if I want to cover by the Euclidean ball, but also uh, because you could say I could I could make my uh, convex body really, really small and then I cover by the Euclidean ball easily. I didn't want a such a uh, degenerate situation, so I want to cover by the Euclidean ball, but still keep the body relatively big. Uh, so he actually proved that I can do this essentially uh, in the best way possible because I have to tolerate uh, factors, um, some constants raised to the dimension. Uh, so I can find, for any convex body, I can find some uh, ellipsoid initially, let's uh, keep the convex body as is, I can find some ellipsoid such that the volume of the ellipsoid and the volume of the body are equal, and then uh, the cover number of k by this ellipsoid is at most a constant raised to the dimension. And also the cover number of the ellipsoid by the convex body is at most a constant raised to the dimension again. Uh, and we say that if the ellipsoid happens to be now the unit of the ball, uh, then uh, this uh, convex body k is in that position, which is not a, as unambiguously defined as other positions, because you can see here I have a lot of flexibility. If I slightly change the consonant, I could also get other positions being called n positions, but at least there are uh, such positions uh, for which uh, uh, convex body k and the Euclidean ball are very similar to each other, at least in terms of covering. And uh, here I have all three conditions to make clearer what we mean. But in fact, two of the conditions give me the third one. Any two of the conditions give me the, give me the remaining one. Uh, okay, now, what was the motivation for this uh, M position? So Vitaly Newman wanted to... Yeah, sorry. Uh, one slight question. Does, does the uh, absolute constant mean it's irrespective on dimensions? Exactly, of, okay. exactly, exactly. It doesn't depend on uh, anything. Okay. But I can, like here, it's, uh, that's why I said it's not ambiguous. Like I can, I can make it a hundred and you can make it a billion and we're still okay, <laughs> right? But uh, yes, it doesn't uh, uh, depend on the dimension. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Vitaly Milman had in his mind uh, the question of whether we can reverse the Brunikovsky inequality in some cases. And uh, indeed, he uh, discovered that under this condition, so if both, uh, convex bodies are in M position, uh, then we get a reverse of the Brumikovsky void. Of course, we need some constant because otherwise it's, uh, it goes in the other direction. But this constant actually only depends on the constant we had before, and it's an absolute constant. So uh, for any dilates of two bodies in M position, I get uh, the reversed inequality uh, to the Brumikovsky. And uh, this is very quick because actually volumes raised to the power 1 over n are very closely related to volume ratios. Uh, so we have the, the ratio of uh, the volume of uh, the body I want and uh, t plus s times the Euclidean ball is, uh, of course, up abundant by the covering number because if I cover tk plus l, s l by copies of t plus s uh, times the Euclidean ball, uh, then the uh, sum <laughs> of the volumes of these copies, right, which is the cover number times the volume of the Euclidean ball, uh, should uh, uh, be bigger than the volume of uh, the body I'm covering, right? And then there's this trick that I can uh, break when I have Minkowski sums, I can break the cover numbers. So since I assume that both K and L are in, are in M position and T and S will cancel out here, I get that this is upper bounded by some constant to the N. Uh, which gives me what I wanted, right? So, or rather, sorry, it gives me that the uh, nth root of the volume in the numerator is uh, upper bounded by the nth root of the volume in the denominator times some constant. So the n now disappears uh, because I'm taking nth roots. And now I remember that since k and l are in n position, the volume of the ball is equal to the volume of k and the volume of l. 
Or if I want approximately equal, that's still OK. And I get the uh, right hand side that I wanted. OK, note that here the constant that we get is uh, whatever constant we had squared. Right, so that's uh, important for what I will state later. Now, initially this theorem was proved uh, for origin symmetric complex bodies. Uh, and in fact, in that case, it was easy to take the polar. It's like very natural. It's the dual, uh, it's sorry, it's the unit ball, the dual norm. Uh, right, and uh, the formulation we could get equivalently was that all these covered numbers are upper bounded by a constant to the end, right? So we could also uh, control well the covered number of k polar by the polar of the ellipsoid and the covered number of the polar of the ellipsoid by k polar. And then uh, Pizier realized that he could uh, strengthen this theorem. So he proved the following. So uh, essentially, he proved that for every origin symmetric on its body, I can find a good ellipsoid uh, such that not only the covered number of k by this ellipsoid is controlled well, but also the covered number of k by uh, bigger and bigger dialects of the ellipsoid. So essentially, we're saying if I could cover, if I had here my complex body k, which I I'm trying to make as non-ellipsoidal as possible. And then I have found a good ellipsoid here that covers it well. Uh, what if I slightly increase uh, the size of the ellipsoid, right? Presumably, that should lead me to needing fewer copies. And hopefully, I should be able to extract some dependence on how uh, much the number of copies that I need goes down compared to how I increase the size. And that's essentially what uh, PCA uh, managed to do. Uh, so this is achieved for every, uh, essentially the regularity is given by uh, the exponent for t, where t is the size of the dilation, right? Um, and uh, the regularity is all the way up to 2 with 2 non included in several cases. And uh, this is also given by the constants here, which will blow up as uh, alpha uh, approaches to, right? So we cannot exist that. And there's a reason. There are cases where two is the best we can do, or almost two. And again, when uh, actually this ellipsoid can be the Euclidean ball, uh, then we say that k is an alpha regular position. Uh, OK, why did he want this theorem, right? So the reason was that he wanted a better control for the reversal of the Brumikovsky when we were adding more than two convex bodies. Remember what I was saying before, that uh, when I was trying to reverse, the constant I was getting in front was whatever constant I had before for the n position raised to the power two. If I had more bodies, it would start be being raised to the number of bodies that I was adding. Even if all bodies were in n position, I could still not avoid this with this uh, proof. Whereas with these yes proof, uh, you could actually, uh, like in this slightly different position, which is a regular m position, uh, you could get the number of bodies that you're adding still will appear in the constant. It would make worse if you're adding more bodies, but it would appear as a polynomial factor, not an exponent in the constant that uh, appears in the, uh, the bounds for the covered numbers. So that was one improvement that he was aiming for, and he got with this approach. And the other improvement is that he could do uh, more local theory. Oh, I have to do this. Uh, the work would happen yesterday. Um, So the idea here is that uh, suppose I know that the cover number of k, um, sorry, with the by some complex body is less than uh, some constant to the n. Of course, with this, it's easy to see that trying to cover k by the Euclidean ball is more difficult than trying to cover a projection of k by a projection of the Euclidean ball. Of course, the projection of the Euclidean ball would be the Euclidean ball in that subspace. 
be in a different wall in that subspace. So you would still get this bounce. But now that you're taking projections, remember that these things, we can pretend now that everything is symmetric, in which case these things would be um, uh, up to constants raised to the dimension of what I have here, um, uh, roughly equal to the volume ratios. But now I have volume ratios of two bodies in dimension L, right, in some subspace of dimension L. So if I want to raise to some, uh, uh, take some root, uh, rather, I would take the root of uh, uh, the uh, dimension of the ambient space, right? Uh, uh, and to that, if I try to take here one over L, it would go here, and of course, it wouldn't give me anything good because N over L can be uh, huge, especially if I'm looking at uh, really small uh, subspaces, right? Whereas with the uh, PZS uh, approach, the idea would be that here, instead, take some TF such that um, this N over TF to the alpha, so essentially you solve for N over TF to the alpha is equal to L. Uh, right, which would give you here some constant now to the L, which with the L root would cancel out and you would get an absolute constant as an upper bound. And the only thing you would have to pay for would be that here now you have a dilate of the Euclidean wall, so you get this dilate. But when you take uh, L roots here, this dilate goes outside as just a, a linear factor. Right, so you, you can solve for this uh, TF, but this will be a uh, polynomial in N and L compared to uh, before that we had an exponential in N and L, in rather the ratio N over L. Right, so essentially he could start getting better bounds for um, uh, parameters of projections of the convex body, which is precisely what we want to do in local theory. We want to look at projections and sections of the convex body and not just at uh, what happens uh, in the full space. <coughs> okay, now, uh, how do we extend these results to the non-symmetric case? And the answer is uh, not very easily in most cases. So, for example, let's start with uh, the last result, although it's a more recent improvement. I should be focusing on the others, but I will do this quickly. Uh, so, uh, for first of all, sorry, for the M position, Milman's M position, uh, actually the uh, realization that we can uh, generalize to the non-symmetric case happened years after the result, but uh, it happened uh, also a lot of years uh, uh, before the current time, right? So around 2000. So they realized that if I, I center my convex body well enough, right, the shift matters here, uh, because it can make also the, the polar body huge, uh, rather the volume of the polar body huge, and that's bad. Right, but if, for example, I take the bar center of the convex body at the origin, or the center low point of the convex body at the origin, then I have this nice inequality. Uh, I can also get it with very explicit constants, but here I will keep it like that because it's not always. Uh, with explicit constants when I have, for example, center low point. This can be derived by combining flash for center low and Burgen Milman. Right, and it was observed first by Milman and Peugeot and also by Rodinson. Uh, and then, because of that, we have that the cover number of uh, uh, K, um, when I want to cover it by this, uh, what I call symmetric intersection of K with minus K, uh, right, sorry, this is not because of the previous one. This is a general bound that we have for covering numbers. We can uh, compare them to volume ratios, uh, particularly when the body that we're covering with is symmetric, then we have a lot of flexibility to do these comparisons. And then because of the previous result now, the volume ratio is actually good. It's up abundant by some constant to the end. And then I can say, okay, I don't know how to put k in m position, but let's try to put the symmetric intersection of k in m position. So assuming that the center is good, either the bar center or the center low point is uh, at the origin, then we place the symmetric intersection in m position, and we have some nice bounds immediately. So for example, the cover number of the Euclidean ball by k is, has to be smaller than or equal to the cover number of the Euclidean ball by the symmetric intersection, because I'm covering with something smaller in the second case. So it's upper bound and well. And then the cover number of k by the Euclidean uh, ball, I can interject 
any body I want, in this case I will interject the symmetric intersection, because I have bounds for a both covering numbers that I have made appear now. Uh, now, for regular positions, actually gets a bit trickier, right, so this is what I said, uh, this is a more recent result, uh, so we do get regular positions for non-symmetric common bodies again, uh, and we do get them for the same kind of shift. So again, we try to put barrier center or center low point at the origin. Um, and in which case, then we just apply linear transformation, no other shift. And we get this result that we want, which is uh, exactly as in PCS proof, with the caveat that the regularity is not that good. It's actually um, pretty far from what we would hope for. Even if it's a non-symmetric case, we still expect that maybe it's much better. Uh, maybe not two. Maybe something between 205 and 2. Um, and the reason that this is a bit harder and it requires a more delicate approach is that uh, because of this result here, since regularity, regular ellipsoids allow me to do a lot of local theory, we would also expect that I want better bounds locally, right? So for, for projections and sections, I can't just control the volume of k by the volume of the symmetric intersection. I should also control the volume of projections of k by volumes of projections of the symmetric intersection. So morally, the result happens to be equivalent to such a statement here, uh, that I can upper bound the volumes of projections of K, else roots are okay, uh, by volumes of projections of the symmetric intersection, and I am allowed to pay uh, factors of uh, uh, the form N over L to some uh, power, as long as the power is fixed. And uh, what I, why I say it's uh, morally equivalent, because uh, we get the previous result that I had because in the paper uh, I can prove uh, uh, this statement with tau equals 3 when the center low point is at the origin, but then getting the regular ellipsoids for uh, the non symmetric convex body K, because uh, that's the, uh, the uh, boost that you get here, you get something symmetric in K and K polar now, and when K has center low point at the origin, K polar has barycent at the origin. So then Knowing good regularity, you can go back to bounding volumes of projections of K by volumes of projections of other convex bodies that you understand better, and you can get the same result, but with a different tau. That's the only thing that you have to pay. So you can get it also for uh, convex bodies with the bias at the origin. So anytime you pass from one statement to the other, you lose something in the constants, but morally they're equivalent. Uh, also, I should state that you can show that, for example, for the simplex, you cannot take tau, like the simplex is an example, where it shows that you cannot take tau better than one half, and this would not give you the optimal regularity that PCS result gives for symmetric convex bodies. So perhaps a, a different approach is also needed to get something better. Uh, okay, and now, yes, I should also mention that uh, this two... Uh, uh, parameters, so results that are, these uh, types of results that I'm discussing are not unrelated, so that's why I put them in the same talk. Uh, they're actually, um, one can give the other, again, morally, right, we might lose something. So uh, if I have good bounds on the mean width or the mean norm, actually I don't need good bounds on the product, uh, but I only get one side of cover number, so I need maybe good bounds on the other quality as well to get uh, full regularity. So I can actually up about the cover numbers of K by the euclid vogue well. So that's uh, sort of cost inequality. Uh, and uh, it actually uh, uh, works for every uh, ratio of uh, dilation, whatever dilation pattern, right? For every T starting from the origin. Whereas results like PCS always start uh, with T above some uh, fixed constant. Uh, okay, and here we see that uh, uh, we get two regularity, in fact, and uh, the only thing that's uh, uh, needed, which is extra, is the, uh, the a bound on the mid width, which, as uh, you will see later, uh, there are cases that I cannot uh, have it better, like uh, there are on the quantity for which, even if I optimize in anything else, uh, in terms of volume and everything else that I need, uh, so uh, for this to make sense, uh, I would have it, let's say, log n or square root log n. So uh, you don't get um, something without any, uh, with an absolute constant, but that's okay. That's also consistent with PCS result because remember in PCS result, I could never get exact to regularity. 
Uh, for some complex bodies, perhaps I would, uh, the, the constant would blow up. And why does it blow up? Because in some cases, I will get this uh, extra logarithmic factor at the very least. Uh, but that's still very good for uh, applications, right? Some extra logarithmic factors. And also, if I have a good regular imposition, uh, then I can bound a uh, good regular imposition. Now means that I can bound uh, the cover numbers of k by dilations of the pole, but also the cover numbers of k polar by dilations of the pole. So I have both. Then I can bound the product of mk and mk star uh, reasonably well. And in fact, if I had almost two regularity, then I could bound it by some uh, logarithmic factors bigger than the log n that we, you will see we get in the uh, symmetric case, but still much better than what we know in the non-symmetric case. And this is done uh, via chaining argument, so maybe I can explain it just a bit. So essentially you have, you have that mk star, <coughs> uh, is um, this uh, quantity here, which I can write in this way. So it's maximum uh, dot product of uh, phi uh, with x, where x varies over k. And then the idea is that when I have the regularity, let's suppose this is my k. So I start at some level, right? I cover by uh, uh, dilations of the ball some radius, and I have some centers here. Maybe I want to cover by dilations of uh, uh, a ball, uh, smaller dilations now of uh, the unity of the ball. So then I will have more centers. And then I can go even lower. So I will know even, I will need even more centers. But in principle, once I do this and reach uh, a certain level density of the center, so that I'm very close to any other complex body, in which case uh, the error I would get here by taking dot dot not with x itself, but with some uh, point close by from the centers would be negligible in the end, right? So morally, I can essentially discretize the problem. And then uh, it's uh, essentially calculations to see how the maximum um, of uh, linear functionals integrates over the sphere and uh, um, control against the bounds you have for the number of the centers that you need. Uh, now, what do we know about mm star k? Remember the way I'm defining it, or the way I'm denoting it here, rather, is essentially this is the infimal over all possible linear transformations of the complex body and all shapes that keep the origin in the interior. Right, it turns out that when I'm in the origin symmetric case, actually, shapes do not help me. So it's better to actually keep the origin as the center of symmetry. Uh, and then uh, there is a theorem from way back, based on how the uh, theory develops now, how fast, right, from the 70s, 80s, right, which uh, follows from uh, seminal results of uh, several people, right, uh, Pizier, Lewis, and Figuel, Tomczak, Jägerman, uh, which uh, showed, essentially, when we combine all these results, that I can find a linear transformation of my convex body uh, such that the corresponding product of mean norm mean width, which obviously uh, upper bounds mm star k, is at most logarithm of, uh, essentially, this is the distance from the Euclidean ball, the ratio of the second radius and the in radius. Right, and uh, we recall now, note that here I'm, I'm allowed to take in film over all possible transformations. The film where this ratio is minimized may be different from the T1 I'm taking here, but that's fine. Uh, and uh, we know uh, now, since I'm allowed to take infimum over any linear transformation I want, that for example, I could put my convex body in John's position, in which case I have that the Euclidean ball is contained and touches actually the convex body, and the circumradius then is at most square root n. Right, so then the logarithm will be at most log n. So we have a really, really good bound for M star k, and why I say really, really good bound, because if I took, for example, mm star of uh, the cross boso, so the L1, uh, the, the unit ball of the L1 norm, uh, which is the same as mm star of uh, the cube. 
So this is roughly uh, square, sorry, square log n, right? So um, we don't know, this is like the thing that we don't know whether we can improve the log n here to square log n, uh, and we don't have other examples which exceed the square log n, uh, but essentially this uh, is settled. On the contrary, in the non-symmetric case, it's highly non-settled. Uh, so there's a theorem in the sense that people do not believe that what I have now is the optimal result. So there's a theorem by Rudison again, uh, several years ago, right, uh, more than two decades ago, uh, which says that when I have a non-symmetric uh, convex body, uh, then I can find an affine image of it. So here, this is crucial. Uh, that um, I will have to also shift the body, and the center that Bruson uh, chooses, the best one, uh, actually does not seem to be barycenter or center low point. Uh, so we don't even know, like it's, it's a new point that should probably uh, be worth studying uh, separately. So I can find a shift that will still contain the origin in the situ, so that all the corner just makes sense. Uh, in which case my mm star will be bounded by m to the one third times some logarithmic factors, which we really don't care about because the order of magnitude here is dominated by m to the one third. Uh, and the, uh, let me see. So the idea here, maybe I can really describe. So the idea is, uh, as with all these problems, that we try to reduce it to the symmetric case, but uh, here he uh, realizes that the reduction, again, has to be super delicate, right? So what he does is that, so the first thing that we can note is that uh, the n star of k, which is the integral of the support function, um, so this, well, there is a constant, <coughs> but it's an explicit constant. This would be the same as m star of uh, k minus k. Right, so it's not necessarily the m star that we worry about so much, but it's the m k. And essentially, it's the question of what is the best shift here in order to make this quantity uh, as small as possible. And uh, what he does is, again, he uh, reduces this to a question of volumetric bounds. But now, instead of taking, um, um, he reduces it to uh, comparing k with k minus k, but he compares uh, volumes, let me say L is the dimension of uh, the subspace, of sections now of the different body with, and there is a, a, a constant here that will pay, which depends on the dimension, uh, times sections of volume, again in um, uh, volume uh, of in L dimensional subspace of a shift, uh, let me use a different, of K intersecting with the subspace. And here he takes supremum over all uh, shifts. Uh, use Y for the shift. 
Right, and the fact that he pays here is, let me see, what exquisite min of um, square root L and N over uh, L. Uh, yes, uh, and since I've taken L space now, there's no uh, exponent here. So square root L. And uh, you can see that essentially this minimum, if I, I, I want to have such an equality for every L, every dimension L, uh, if I have such an equality here, and I try to optimize here, this is upper bounded by n to the one third, if I want to, in the end, end up with a common factor that does not depend on the L. Right, and that's where the n to the one third comes from. Right, so uh, essentially he tries to compare the min norm of such a, uh, a convex border which is now symmetric and you could make it good based on um, the previous theorem that I had, well, sorry, the theorem that I saw on the slide, to the min norm of uh, such a section of a convex body. But first of all here, uh, this is, uh, ah, and he uh, observes that if the volumes are close enough, uh, whatever close enough it is, whatever factor you have here, you will pay it in the estimates. If the, uh, um, uh, volumes are close enough, then perhaps you can pass to a further subspace, a section of the section, or a, um, a projection of the section, and he played with these things, and then the mean norms will be close enough. Just volumetric estimates are not enough, but if you pass to subspaces, then the volumetric estimates give you a, a good comparison of uh, the corresponding quantities. But the, the thing is that also he doesn't control the shift here, right? So every time he says it, there is a shift that works that makes this estimate good. We don't know what the shift is. Yes? Yes. And then once he had good comparison of the corresponding quantities for a subspace for sections of uh, uh, the convex bodies, he perhaps he can iterate this procedure, right? So work with whatever remains in the orthogonal subspace of this, uh, take again the same kind of, uh, repeat the same kind of argument up to some point where the dimension of the subspace becomes so small that just controlling uh, crudely is enough, not to ruin the bounds too much. Right, but also that's what I meant, right? The center which you will choose in the end depends on the shifts. And in fact, it's not even the first shift that he takes because the, the next shift in the other subspace, he will have to essentially take a complex combination to have a common point that still works with roughly the same estimates. So it's really a new point that he uh, essentially uh, uses as his uh, optimal point or one that's close to the optimal. <coughs> Right, and I don't have any other slides. Let me just uh, finish with this. I meant to write up on the board that in the same paper, he uses this result to derive a, a, an upper bound for uh, distances uh, between two, two convex bodies. So the Banach Mazur distance, uh, by which we mean if I have two convex bodies in Rn, uh, I will look at the, uh, let, let me say, is that uh, in femur. Uh, of uh, lambda uh, greater than zero such that there is some x in Rn uh, and some t uh, linear transformation uh, such that L will be contained in uh, P of k minus x. So I have to shift one of the convex bodies and transform it a bit and then uh, I will be able to contain L in it but also have this be contained in lambda times L. And I want to optimize in the lambda here, right? So this would be the Banahazo distance if I don't assume any symmetry from the convex bodies. If I assume symmetry, again, we can show that uh, the best shift is actually not do anything, keep them origin symmetric, both of them. Right, and uh, we know uh, from John's theorem that the Banahazo distance of every uh, symmetric of, uh, let me use Q now. 
the Banach Mazur distance of every uh, of any symmetric convex body uh, from the uh, Euclidean ball is at most square root n. Uh, and if I take now two uh, origin symmetric convex bodies, uh, then again I can interject uh, the Euclidean ball. This is essentially my triangular ball. It's just a multiplicative triangular ball. And I will have that this is upper bounded by n, square root n times square root n, which is n. So that would be a general upper bound for uh, origin symmetric bodies. And thankfully, we know from Gluskin, so Gluskin's uh, random holotopes, that there exists q1, q2. Uh, symmetric uh, such that the Banach Mazur distance is uh, lower bounded by some constant uh, smaller than one times n, but still of the same order of magnitude. So the upper bound that we get by essentially using Jones theorem turns out to be optimal in the origin symmetric case because of the result by Kluskin as well. But if we try the same result uh, for our non-symmetric complex bodies now, we know that the upper bound here should be n, and we know that it's attained. So if I try to do the same procedure, I would have n squared here instead. And unfortunately, uh, we don't have any example of uh, complex bodies whose banach mazur distance exceeds n. So we don't know whether this is uh, optimal for the, in the non-symmetric case, or whether this is optimal in the non-symmetric case, or whether there's something in between. But at the very least, the best bound again is given by Rusev in the same paper because he related, essentially he proved, oh sorry, that for any two convex bodies, this is upper bounded by some constant times, again, I will have to face some logarithmic factors, but I don't care about that now, times n, times n m star of k plus m m star of L. And because of his result, again, I can optimize here in the position. Um, because of his result, we get that the, the Banach Mazur distance of any two complex bodies in a rank is essentially n to the four thirds. It's n times the bound Ozone has for the NM star. Right. And again, as I said, this is given from the origin symmetric case where essentially the problem settled. So that's all I had to say. Alright, uh, so thank you for your talk. Are there any questions? Oh, okay. Thank you. So there exists x and y, so that's L minus y, lambda, l minus y. Thank you. Yeah. The log n over l in your log form, where does it come from? Ah, um, so it would come from, hmm, sorry, can you repeat in which point exactly, because I can uh, On slide 14, I think. You mean in the regular ellipsoids? Okay, just to make sure, because then it appears in several uh, places and there's a reason always. Uh, yeah. Here? Yeah, here. Ah, so actually that's a, a, a good question because I can answer. So one of the factors, remember I said uh, when I have center low point at the origin, I get it with uh, tau equals three. One of the factors comes from this. I use actually Rudson's result. Uh, it's a minimum, right? So I could uh, forget this and just use the n over L. Uh, the other factor comes from Fragalese's result, if you're uh, uh, aware of it, that says, uh, I will, uh, say it, that says that the maximum, uh, the volume of uh, the maximum um, so the shift that gives me the maximum volume here of uh, such a, uh, a, a section 
is uh, lower bounded by some constant n over L uh, times the uh, volume of the section at the very center. At the section should be, or when uh, k has very center of the origin, which in fact I apply because I say it's not a low point at the origin here, so I apply it here with uh, k polar. And in this case, because I have assumed the center low point of k is at the origin, this would be a uh, very center of k uh, polar would be uh, at the origin. Uh, and then the other one, the, the, uh, the third factor, comes from a, a essentially Blaschke center low inequality for projections and sections, where because we project, we lose something again, and uh, we lose uh, an n over l, which is also optimal. If you try for the simplex, it's, uh, yeah. And below the log m, or L, the additional factor, or the... Ah, below. For the barrister, you mean? This? Yeah. Ah, this is because uh, now I don't have... Um, we don't have uh, Fred Lee's result for the center low point, right? So we could not repeat the same procedure as uh, before if I have Barry center at the origin instead of uh, center low point of the origin, in which case the center low point of the polar would be at the origin, not the Barry center. Uh, so instead I use this theorem, and in this theorem I have already lose, uh, lost something, right? Because you also need to, uh, essentially you use this result that I had here, for the center low point, uh, sorry, this is other I have here for the center low point with three, but then uh, you use this to reduce uh, the case of k to the case of k minus k and the case of the symmetric intersection of k, and then you apply PCS theorem and that adds you more factors because of uh, the bounds I had before, right? You have n over, let's say, k minus k times the dilation of the Euclidean ball, and you want to pass to cover numbers for projections, um, you shouldn't take t as you had before, you should take some t which uh, cancels out to the constant here n. Let's say you have t squared like you're in the optimal situation, right? I don't want to take t a constant, an absolute constant, because that would give me a constant to the n, and when I try to take L roots, this constant to the n will be in the exponent. Uh, instead, I take t squared, uh, so sorry, I take n over t squared is equal to L. So this will uh, leave and it will become L, and when I which would correspond to essentially taking t over squared n over l. Right, so this will go out as a polynomial factor instead of having it in the exponent, and that's the extra n over l that you see, because it's one for one direction, k minus k compared to the Euclidean ball, but then I also need to compare the symmetric intersection with the Euclidean ball. Okay. Yes? Uh, you. So if you change the intersection to the Minkowski sum, if I do what, sorry? In the section to the Um That's the whole problem, right? You have to essentially work with both. Both, uh, you sandwich your co co convex body K from above and from below. The above is the difference body, the Minkowski sum, right? Yeah. And the below is a symmetric intersection. Right? Oh, yes. Remember, you need uh, bounds for, ah, I have the here. You need bounds for cover number of K by the ball, but also bounds for the ball, for covering the ball by K. And one is compared nicely to cover numbers of k minus k by the ball, whereas the other is compared nicely to covering the ball by the symmetric intersection of k. Okay. If I put difference body there, I make this cover number easier. Oh, I so I don't know how it dominates the other one. I see. Uh, is there any inequalities? I mean, the next case for the projections. Well, oh, the projections are easy. It's easy. Because um, mm, if I have a, a different body, you mean? Probably. Because it's uh, Roger Shepard, then. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, I was wondering about the possible connection between the Brownov bonding M and M star with the connection with the slicing problem. Is there any? Uh, no, really. There is some connection not helping the slicing, but instead not being helped by the slicing. But it would be nice to know some. 
So uh, there are some results by Emmanuel Milman uh, showing that essentially you have optimal mean width in the isotropic position, model of some logarithmic factors that you, you should expect. Mm -hmm. So the logarithmic position is almost an optimum M star position, uh, which is uh, the isotropic position, what I mean. The isotropic position, which is good to know because the isotropic position is more concretely found compared to the MM star position, which is uh, probably more existence rather than. Uh, but we still don't know good bounds for the mean norm. Uh, it's again Yanopoulos and Emmanuel Milman that have something for the symmetric case, and then they rely on PCS theorem. So with this result, you can get some extension to the non symmetric case, but the bounds are really uh, far from what we would expect should be optimal. But I, need, I think you need uh, uh, results that would imply slicing in order to get the optimal uh, estimates there. Model well, logarithmic factors, but uh, this I ignore. And what about a possible like, stronger conjecture? I mean, which are the candidates for the maximizer and the minimizer for this MM star quantity? I don't know. I would expect that the, 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 the cube and the, the yeah. crossword of our maximizers is yeah. always, yeah, <laughs> or at least they're conjectured to be the maximizers, but I don't know. And minimizers, I think it's the UVM law. Yeah. I showed it. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Or if yes. Can you go back to the slide where you had like volume of K intersect minus K is less than a constant times volume? Which one? Uh, here, this is, yeah, the top one. That's just from Roger Shepard, right? In their paper, not. No, 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 no. Uh, Roger Shepard would be difference body. This is. Uh, no, 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 not the Roger Shepard inequality, but in the same paper, they proved an inequality relating the volume of K intersect minus K in the volume. Not sure. I don't. We can check later, but I think this has appeared for the first time in Milan Peugeot, where they actually get also two to the n, yeah. but you have to have Barisant at the origin. And uh, wrote it at the same time. It was essentially, uh, Milman Peugeot was uh, published in 2000, probably it appeared already in 1999. Wrote it on the paper I was talking about, 1999. Right, he was noticing it because I think he wanted it for the Santa Lowe point that you can get this result for the Santa Lowe point, essentially combining Blaschke Santa Lowe and Bugen Milman. But in that case, it's more crude because you get an, a constant which is not like two to the n, it's some bigger constant. Uh, it depends on the constant you have at the beginning moment, for example, and still you lose also because you go from one inequality to the other. So I don't think this is Roger Shepard. It, it could be Roger Shepard that it's convex how k with minus k. Well, I only ask because there's a paper by uh, Shiri Arstein Avedon where they needed this and they cited it. That's where I first learned it. And in that one, they cited the Roger Shepard paper. Uh, we can check again. I might be mistaken, but uh, these are the references I'm aware of. The constant here is not that. Hmm? The constant here is not the best one. Oh, it's not the best one. There, there have been, have been improvements. improvements. I mean, when it was not. It was So equality is conjectured to be at the simplex, but we don't know. Okay. And uh, there have been improvements. There have been improvements to Milman for sure uh, since then. Uh, uh, but. Uh, Yes, for this application, they don't matter. Yeah. It, it, remarks that it's, uh, it would be nice, of course, if it's uh, what? Uh, my, my, yeah. Yeah. Star or more star on the upcoming drone. I really doubt because for symmetric bodies, uh, symmetric in the sense, permutation of coordinates, you always have square root of law. Mm, okay, it's maybe. It's another result of the years that for. What is you have square root of the uh, of distance? And by the way, we of course don't know what you said. The uh, star is bounded by square root of log or log. Or something in between. What? Or something yeah, in between. But if the worst body is octagon, then you know that it's square root. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? If not, then let's thank the speaker again.